And joining me now is Federal Labor MP Matt Thistlethwaite and Federal Liberal Senator Paul Scar. Welcome to the show, both of, the, both of you. G'day, Shari. Thanks very much. And both in Canberra, unfortunately. Um, now, this morning, David Spears did a terrific interview with Richard Miles, Deputy Labor Leader, where Miles got into quite uh, a pickle over whether or not Labor would, in fact, give approval for a coal-fired power station if the market were to go with one. Let's have a look at what he had to say. Industry decided to build a, a coal-fired power station. Would you be happy with that or would you block that? Ultimately, this is a matter for the market. No, for um, the government to give no, approval. No. Uh, well, sh well, then the, the normal environmental approval should should apply, and that process should apply. But so that's ultimately, a maybe. that's a maybe. Ultimately, the question here is for the government uh, in terms of whether or not it will fund a power fired uh, a coal a coal fired power station. Now, at the end, what's going on here is this government is walking down that track. This government is walking down the track of actually putting up public money to subsidise something that well, the they market won't go... They, no, no, they're they're no, holding they, a feasibility they, study, to be clear. Yeah, which is being paid for with public money. Yes, but they so haven't that, decided so where, yet to go ahead with it. Yes, but, but they've already gone down the path of putting public money into this. Into the Matt, starting with you, what's your position on this? Do you think Labor should support uh, or should give approvals for a coal-fired power station? Well, Richard's right, Shari. These are assets that are predominantly owned and operated by corporations, not by government. And it's up to a corporation to decide whether or not they wish to invest in one in the future. And by as David judging Spears on the market, repeatedly, as David Spears repeatedly pointed out in that interview, uh, it does require government approvals as well. And that's the point that he was putting to Richard Miles. So, you know, what do you think on this? Well, most of the approvals are given at a state level for projects such as that. There is a federal approval in terms of an environmental approval, and that's under the Environment, Biodiversity and Conservation Act. Um, and that basically looks at whether or not there's a threat to endangered species. So the proponent would have to uh, give evidence to show that there would be no threat to protected species. And then it's up to a minister uh, as to whether or not they'll approve that. But Labor's not in government at the moment, Shari. Uh, the, the coalition are in government. Um, now they're but, looking but, so, at so, uh, a so feasibility study. So on that question, study. you actually are giving an answer that Richard Miles didn't give. So if there were no environmental issues uh, when it came to uh, signing off on this, you would be happy with a coal-fired power station to go ahead? Well, look, I don't think that uh, government should be encouraging coal-fired power stations into the future. No, I think government should be encouraging the uptake of renewable energy. Uh, I've got four young children. Um, in my life, Shari, and I want to make sure that we pass on a cleaner environment uh, to them. And we know that coal-fired power stations are one of the biggest producers of any technology of carbon emissions anywhere in the world. And to ensure that we reduce our carbon footprint as a nation and that we're doing the right thing by our kids, I think that government should be encouraging the uptake of renewable energy. But this government is proposing to look at underwriting a coal-fired power station in Queensland and I think that that is a bad idea because we all know that uh, the private sector is moving away from coal-fired power so it makes it a risky investment and secondly the price of renewable energy is coming down every year and when you're well, talking Paul, about an investment that wouldn't come online for another eight to ten years it's more likely that renewable energy will be cheaper so Paul, the what's, proposal what's your... just doesn't stack up. Paul, the government itself, the Liberal Party itself and the coalition is in a bind over this issue. You've got MPs who represent inner city electorates uh, like Higgins and, and uh, Katie Allen and also Tim Wilson who are saying we want more action on climate and then you've got um, some figures in the Nationals and Conservative MPs who say the climate setting at the moment in the Liberal Party, what we're doing, on, what you're doing on action is enough. Paul, where do you stand on this? Well, I stand in favour of the policies which the government took to the last election and which were overwhelmingly supported by the people of Queensland. And those policies included a policy for the federal government, where appropriate, as in this case, to provide funding for a feasibility study for the proposed project in Collinsville in my home state of Queensland. So you, let's think, there be clear, no further, you think there needs to be no further overarching uh, emissions reduction policy? I think the federal government needs to stay true to its commitments in the Kyoto uh, Treaty and we're on track to meet those commitments and we need to look at technology. Technology is the answer, in my view, to many of these issues. But just coming back to the, the feasibility study for the coal-fired power station, proposed high-efficiency, low-emission coal-fired power, power station at Collinsville, 
The issue for the people of Queensland is they want low cost and reliable electricity. And that is absolutely fundamental for the refineries, the smelters, the large businesses and the small businesses in Queensland. So, and so what, watching Richard Miles on Insiders this morning was like watching a patient in a dentist chair. It was absolutely painful. The Labor Party still hasn't got its head around what policies it needs to put in place to protect the jobs of people in my home state of Queensland. Well, Paul, what do you say then to the MPs within your own party room who were very vocal last week when they wanted more action to reduce emissions? Well, I won't comment on what was actually discussed in the party room. I'm not asking I was you to comment on it. That, I'm uh, saying it was confidential, I'm not asking you to, to, to discuss what was said in the party room. I'm saying what's sure, your reaction sure, to the MPs who want sure. more action on climate change? Well, I think all of us as representatives for our local constituencies, whether or not you're a senator or a lower house member, we have an obligation to stand up and fight for our constituencies and what we're, what we're hearing. But you don't agree and with them. I will certainly do that. But and you I don't think, agree well, with that. Well, I think all it Well, I think we're on track to meet our Kyoto Treaty uh, emission targets and I'm in favour of us sticking to the policies which we took to the last election. If we can do better, if we can do better, than what our commitments were in, under the Kyoto Treaty, without pushing up electricity prices, without jeopardising jobs for no tangible benefit, then, then that would be great. Um, but Matt, we've got to Matt, keep electricity prices down and we've got to protect jobs in Queensland and in Australia. Matt, it is the case that neither of Australia's two major po political parties at the moment have an overarching policy to reduce emissions. Why doesn't Labor have one when it's been attacking the government so strongly on this issue? Well, we had one when we were in government, uh, Shari. We had a very, very strong policy. We had a carbon price. Uh, we established the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. We established the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And we boosted the renewable energy target. All of those policies were working. But and now we were you're reducing putting pressure, emissions. You're putting pressure and on the we're Prime Minister electricity now uh, to reduce emissions further. But the Labor Party doesn't have its own policy. What is Labor's policy? Well, Shari, we, we lost that election in 2013. We took two subsequent policies to the people. It's now 2020, um, so what's your policy elections. now? Yeah, well, 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 we lost those elections, Shari, and in the wake of those, it's only natural that we would review our policies and consult with the Australian public. But there's only one party that has delivered fair income action on climate change in government in this country, and that is the Labor Party. So we've got the strongest track record results... when it comes... Do you think those election results tell you that, on climate change? That, that there's not the public appetite for it? And we accept that, and that's why we're reviewing our policy. Uh, but our job in opposition now is to hold the government to account. And the government doesn't have a policy. They don't have a policy for reducing emissions. Uh, they don't have a policy for the energy sector. And as a result, energy prices have been going through the roof and our emissions have been going up. So our job at the moment is to hold the government to account and to say to them, well, the Australian people want action. They want stronger action on climate change and they want to see reduced electricity prices and they're not you'd getting it from to, this government You'd be able at the to moment. mount that attack, wouldn't you, a, a, a bit more strongly if Labor had its own policy uh, on reducing emissions. But, but the, the truth is, isn't it, Matt, that Labor is just as divided as the coalition when it comes to the issue of coal. You know, you've got Joel Fitzgibbon out there fighting to protect uh, coal miners' jobs and then you have other parts of the Labor Party that want to move entirely to renewables. No, I don't accept that at all. I think uh, the Labor's Labor Party is probably the most united party at the moment when it comes to action on climate change. And we've got the so best track record you don't have a of actually on it. producing results. Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, we've said that uh, we don't believe the government should be using carryover credits from Kyoto to meet their emissions reduction targets. That's a, a policy that Labor's had at the last election and that we think that the government should adopt. Paul, are well, you going to have to use carryover credits? The government should respond to that and say... Uh, whether or not they're going to use carryover well, Paul, targets and dodgy you, ta I, accounting is, tactics. Paul, are you going to have to use carryover credits from Kyoto to meet the Paris targets? Well, I think we'll have to see what, how things develop. But can I just say this? I, I really don't understand how you can criticise someone else's policy when you don't have a policy yourself. It, it just baffles me. But the same works, the same applies to you. Labor, you don't have a policy either and no, you're criticising well, him. With, with respect, with respect, our policy is as you're seeing it unfold and as you saw it unfold a week what? or so ago with the agreement with the agreement that was entered into between the federal government and the new south wales government with co-funding 
to try and get 70 petajoules of extra gas into that eastern gas market well, in order in that, to get gas prices down policy. and using gas and using gas using gas as a transition fuel. So there are things that are happening every day of the week which demonstrate what our policy is. Well, and that, that even includes that policy the is provision... a bit of a shambles because the New South Wales government say it's not going to spend a cent uh, when it comes to putting more gas into the market and that they, they described, Matt Keane uh, in an interview with me described that whole $2 billion as a commitment to, to, green, uh, emit, to reducing green emissions and renewables but yet the Prime Minister thought he was committing money um, to, to have more gas into the market so even that uh, commitment is a shambles and, and shows the division within the coalition. But can I just move on to another topic? Well, I did, the... Sorry, just on just sorry, just on that point, I can't let that go through to the keeper, I'm sorry, but uh, the issue for the New South Wales government is whether or not they meet that obligation through importing gas or opening up gas fields like the Narrabri gas field. So uh, opening up the Narrabri gas field is not going to require the New South Wales government to spend any money. It's just going to require them to get out of the way of the project proponents of the Narrabri gas field. Yeah, but uh, they've pointed out the New South Wales government that if they fail to inject the extra 70 petajoules of gas into New South Wales by 2022, the only consequence is a review, a market review. Now, just moving on to the I'm, coronavirus I'm, I'm and the impact it's it. having on the economy. Mm and on the budget surplus. It looks uh, now like it'll be very difficult for Josh Frydenberg to announce a budget surplus in May. Matt Thistlethwaite, do you think that there should be a surplus at the moment? Well, Shara, the economy's been struggling for quite some time. Now, the government is, is saying that uh, because of coronavirus and the bushfires that they may not meet a surplus. Uh, but the fact is that the economy's been struggling for well over three years now with low wages growth, with very low uh, below trend growth uh, with low business investment. Um, I think that what uh, is occurring is that unfortunately the coronavirus and the bushfires are only going to make a bad situation worse. So Australians were already struggling, now they're really struggling because of what's going on with coronavirus Matt, um, last and year, the bushfires. Last Whether year Labor they, was putting they, they pressure... They a surplus is up to them. Yeah. Matt, last year Labor was putting pressure on the government to inject more uh, stimulus into the economy or to bring forward mm. more infrastructure projects or, or some kind of stimulus because the economy was slagged. Uh, was sluggish last year. Do you think now, or do you, do you accept now that that was actually the wrong call because uh, the economy, you know, or the, the, the government would have had a lesser ability to respond to the bushfire recovery effort and to the coronavirus had it done that cash splash in 2019? Well, look, no, no one can crystal ball what's going to happen with the weather, uh, Shari. So at, the, at that time, it was, it was the right call because you had an economy that was flailing. Uh, you had low growth. Low wages, so uh, very low that business that investment, uh, rising unemployment. And, well, the, the Reserve Bank at the time was saying, Shari, that the government should so bring forward so infrastructure investment. So Labor and the RBA got it they wrong? Should. No, Labor I'm and not, the RBA I got think, it wrong? I don't know. I, I, no, I, I don't accept your characterisation at all. I think but had, that, you, had, had uh, at Australia, that point in time... Had the Australian time, government the responded Labor, like that, it would have made the recovery effort more difficult now. Exactly. Uh, at that point in time, Labor and the Reserve Bank were saying the same thing, that the government should bring forward investment in infrastructure and should try and boost the economy and stimulate growth. And no one can crystal ball what's going to happen um, with the weather. We can only deal with the circumstances as they arise. And it's now, I think, up to the government to explain to the Australian public whether or not we are going to be able to meet that surplus that they laid down, uh, that they said that in my EFA that they were going to meet or not. Paul, was that advice from the RBA and Labor wrong? Well, certainly the advice from Labor was wrong. And I sat in the Senate last year and day after day we had Labor Party senators get up and say the government needed to spend billions and billions of dollars on incentives, investment, etc. And did, did, did uh, forget RBA about the budget wrong, surplus. Then? We now, well, the, AB, the RBA did talk about bringing forward things like infrastructure spending and the government did bring forward some infrastructure, infrastructure spending at the, uh, at the end of last year. But I just want to make this point. Because the budget is in such a good position, we are now able to respond both through the $2 billion bushfire uh, project and also through whatever response is required to the coronavirus. And we must remember China being one of our major trading partners. If you look back at when SARS, uh, the SARS epidemic was hitting, uh, hitting Asia, we now trade four times as much with China as we did back then. 
So coronavirus is going to have a bigger impact on the Australian economy than the SARS virus did 13 do, or 14 do, years ago. And we need to keep that into account. Do both of you think that this virus has, has shown that Australia has an over-reliance on, on China, Matt? Well, certainly China's our uh, one of, well, it is our most important trading partner in terms of, of dollar values, uh, and particularly around education and the number of students that have been yeah. coming to Australia as a big contributor to, to growth. Um, ultimately, you want to try and have a diversified uh, trade policy, and, and we support uh, making sure that you have in place policies that, that encourage that. But it's a fact that China has been a very, very large trading partner for Do you think we need Australia. to diversify more in the future? Do you think that there's, there's a lesson out of this? Oh, look, I think that, uh, you know, any, any encouragement to diversification is obviously better for any co economy throughout the world. And the more that any government can do to encourage diversification. We've got um, the Indonesian president coming to address the parliament this week. Indonesia's mm -hmm. on our doorstep, I think. There's opportunities for Australia to boost its trading relationship with Indonesia and hopefully that's something that can come out of this visit. visit. So d development uh, mm. of diversification is a good thing. Paul, what, what's your view on whether uh, we've had an over-reliance on China? Well, I'd, I'd rather not talk about an over-reliance on China and more about pursuing opportunities with other about. trading partners. That's what I'm asking you about. Do you well, think we do need to well, diversify? Do you agree with Matt? We do need, I agree, we do need to diversify and I agree with Matt that uh, the trip by the Indonesian President, President Widodo, tomorrow, his addressing of the Joint Houses of Parliament is a really positive thing and the Indonesian Parliament approved the uh, Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement, the new treaty between Australia and Indonesia, and we need to boost our trade and investment between Indonesia and Australia. At the moment, it only constitutes something like 2 to 2.5 per cent of our services and goods and I think we can increase that substantially. I think we also need to continue pursuing uh, our relationship with India. I think those two great democracies of the Indo-Pacific region, India and Indonesia, provide a lot of opportunities for Australia. Matt Thistlethwaite, Paul Scar, really appreciate your time tonight and have a, a fun week in Canberra and uh, hope you get a lot done. Thank you very, very much. much.